Welcome to the 15th meeting in 2015 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. Can I please remind everyone present to turn off uh, mobile phones, tablets or other electronic devices. Um, our first item of business today is to take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and Economy in relation to subordinate legislation concerning the Public Services Reform Act. Mr Swinney is joined today by his official, Victoria Bruce. I would like to welcome our witnesses to the meeting and invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a short opening statement, but remind him not to move the motion at this point. Uh, thank you, Convener. The Scottish Government is seeking to extend Part 2 of the Public Services Reform Scotland Act 2010 for a further five years. This part of the PSR Act came into effect on 1 August 2010, but due to the addition of a sunset clause during the passage of the original bill, its powers expire on 1 August 2015. Part 2 allows Ministers to make orders to improve the exercise of public functions having regard to efficiency, effectiveness and economy, and to remove or to reduce burdens. Eight orders have to date been taken forward on the basis of Part 2, three using Section 14, Efficiency, Effectiveness and Economy, and five using Section 17, Removing or Reducing Burdens. In summary, these orders have declassified the General Teaching Council for Scotland as a public body and turned it into an independent, profession-led organisation, transferred the functions of the Public Standards Commissioner for Scotland and the Public Appointments Commissioner for Scotland to a new Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life in Scotland at the request of the Scottish Parliament corporate body, created the roles of Prison Monitoring Coordinator and Independent Prison Monitor and transferred the functions of Prison Visiting Committees to those roles, provided the basis for measures to provide a greater level of confidence in the working relationship between landlords and tenant farmers, enabled ministers to recover the costs of Education Scotland carrying out inspection of independent further education colleges and English language schools, helped to streamline and simplify the planning system in two specific areas, and allowed NHS National Health Service Scotland to provide shared services across the public sector with a view to improving efficiency and productivity. Although during the passage of the original bill, members expressed concern that these powers might be misused, the fact that a relatively small number of orders have been taken forward to make important but small-scale changes should provide reassurance that the powers have been used appropriately. In each case, the orders were subject to full public consultation, parliamentary scrutiny and, where necessary, to amendment. Where significant changes to the public body's landscape have been proposed, these have quite appropriately been delivered through primary legislation. A recent example is the merger of Historic Scotland and the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Scotland, which is taken forward through the Historic Environment Bill. It is vital to retain the order-making powers for another five years, as these provide Government and Parliament with the flexibility to make changes quickly as and when opportunities arise, without taking forward primary legislation. Streamlining and simplifying the public body's landscape is a continuing process and wider developments such as the further devolution of powers to Scotland and the ongoing challenging financial context mean that the powers continue to be relevant and necessary. I should like to reassure members that the additional safeguards introduced by Parliament during consideration of the original Bill, including the in relation to consultation and scrutiny, will remain in place. And in response to points raised by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, that the Scottish Government has not re revised its approach, approach to consultation. We continue to believe that consultation is an important aspect of Scottish Government working methods and should be carried out on proposals for legislation, except on rare occasions like this. As the order seeks only to extend the duration of Part 2 and the provisions themselves contain no detail, the only views that a consultation could have elicited would have been for or against consultation and would not have led to any changes to the order. It is therefore unlike the vast majority of legislation on which full substantive consultation on provisions can take place. We consider that the best evidence of the impact of Part 2 is how it has been used in practice since it came into force. On each occasion, the orders have been subject to full consultation. There have been no communications to the Scottish Government since the enactment of the 2010 Act, suggesting that the powers have caused problems or been used in an inappropriate manner. The Scottish Government continues to believe that they provide an essential mechanism for making small scale changes to public functions. Ultimately, it is for Parliament to decide whether or not the powers should be continued on the basis of their past use and potential future use in relation to improving efficiency, effectiveness and economy and removing and reducing burdens. Very happy to address questions. Thank you very uh, much for that opening statement. And uh, as you've touched on in your statement, the issue, of course, which has uh, come to prominence in terms of uh, this issue is uh, the, the uh, 
response of the Delegated um, Powers and Law Reform Committee uh, and their consideration. They, they have, of course, written to me on the issue of consultation, and uh, you, you, you talked about um, you, your kind of thinking behind that. But just uh, to, to highlight some of the issues which have been which have been raised. Uh, by the, the, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. They said, and I quote, the committee is concerned to note that the government takes a view that it is unlikely that stakeholders would have any particular views on this matter. And they go on to say, uh, furthermore, the committee considers that for members to make an informed decision, there would have been benefit in having the findings of a consultation exercise to draw on. And uh, furthermore, the committee notes that individual occasions on which the powers are exercised have themselves been the subject of consultation but that such instruments raise an entirely different issue to that posed by the current draft order. And the community of that committee, uh, our colleague Nigel Dawn, has uh, therefore asked uh, the Finance Committee to pursue that. So uh, it's just, uh, if I could ask you, uh, um, uh, uh, Cabinet Secretary, um, whether or not you can uh, give us some further ideas of your, your thinking on that matter, given these concerns, which I know you're obviously uh, fully aware of, raised by the DPLRC. I think the, the, the issues around... Um, the provision of these powers in the bill in the first place were well exercised uh, in parliamentary debate and indeed the government responded to the discussions and the, the debate at that time with the uh, provisions that were finally enacted and particularly the sunset clause. Um, we've had the benefit of seeing over a five year period how this power has been utilised and I, I, I think it would be impossible to sustain an argument that said that the power had been used for any purpose other than that for which it was originally conceived. Um, and as I indicated in my opening remarks, convener, um, the government has received no representations since 2010 suggesting in any way that the government had not used these powers for any other purpose. Um, therefore, the judgment I arrived at was that given that um, any change that we would undertake using the powers in the Act would of itself be subject to consultation. The mere provision of a continuation of that responsibility, which had been properly and fully and exhaustively debated within Parliament, didn't merit a specific consultation, uh, given the fact that anything that arose from the exercise of these powers would be of itself subject to consultation and full parliamentary scrutiny as a consequence. So that was the basis of my judgment as to why um, it was appropriate to proceed on this basis. Okay, thank you. Uh, Deputy Convener. Uh, thanks, Convener. Yes, I mean, I mean as you probably know, Cabinet Secretary, I'm on the uh, DPLR committee, so there was some concern expressed. I mean, I suppose, first of all, on the, um, on the principle of the thing, I mean, if there's not been very many issues taken forward in the last five years, why do we actually need to continue it for another five years? Well, we, we have taken forward eight orders, and if we hadn't had the ability to take forward the, um, the approach that has been provided for by the Act, then those changes would either not have taken place or they would have required more exhaustive primary legislation. And I think as I went through, I deliberately went through the range of subjects which have been taken forward as part of the order uh, or, 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 or under this, uh, this provision. These have been um, minor amendments to the landscape of public bodies. The things that habitually have been left unattended to until another primary legislation vehicle comes along which enables some of these things to be done. And then the parliamentary debate often can be about the fact that the government is bringing forward legislation which is covering a multitude of different topics all crammed together under one primary legislation, uh, one piece of primary legislation, which raises concern within Parliament about the focus of legislation, primary legislation that's taken forward. So what this uh, power has given us the ability to do has been to take forward relatively minor issues. Um, those minor issues, I think, will continue to recur as we continue to amend the public body's landscape in Scotland and to uh, address some of these questions. And as a consequence, it is a useful and practical power to have at our disposal to avoid the, the, the recourse to um, more time-consuming uh, primary legislation. 
On the specific point of the consultation, I mean, we know that it was considerably quite controversial when the, the legislation went through, and a number of groups raised the point that, uh, you know, their independence might be compromised and, and issues like that. <laughs> And presumably the sunset clause gave some reassurance that uh, if there were problems or whatever and, and issues like independence, it was for a limited period of time. So, I mean, are we in the position now that we have any idea? Do we know if these groups, you're saying that they haven't made many comments over the last five years, but we're certainly not, we're not going out to ask them if they've got comments. Do they still have these fundamental concerns about independence? Uh, we do not know, do we? Well I, well, I think we, we know in the sense that um, at the time of the passage of this legislation, um, there were a lot of comments made in Parliament about um, the nature of these provisions and what they would be used for, um, and all sorts of um, all sorts of uh, suggestions were made about how these powers would be misused. Now, there's not a single scintilla of evidence to support some of the rather lurid comments that were made during the passage of this legislation back in 2010. So I think from that point of view, I think there is a considerable reassurance that the practical utilisation of these powers has been evidenced by the, um, the, the, the way in which this has been taken forward by the government on legislation that Parliament clearly legislated for in primary, in, in, in primary legislation. So I think the, the, the exercise of the powers has been handled in that effective way. In relation to, and obviously if there were um, issues and causes and concerns that people had about the exercise of these powers, then I'm pretty sure we would have heard about them. But we haven't heard about them in the course of a five-year period. So I think the, um, fr from my perspective, um, Parliament legislated for these powers um, it provided the opportunity for those to be um, extended if Parliament so, choose, uh, so chose and, uh, the Parliament, uh, and Parliament has been invited to do so today. Yeah, I just wonder, I mean, one of the aspects that is considered as to whether there needs to be a consultation or not is the history of the policy area. I mean, would you not accept that the history of this, because it's been controversial, would suggest that there should have been a consultation? No, because I, I think the exercise of the, the the responsibilities within this order has been done in such a fashion that um, it has not given rise to any of the concern that was put to Parliament back in 2010. Um, so all sorts of speculation was put to Parliament in 2010 by people who opposed the uh, provisions the government was wishing to put in place. When we now look at the development since then, there has been no um, substance to those concerns. Uh, so, in my view, uh, something that a provision that Parliament has properly and effectively legislated for um, is simply being provided uh, for, for it, an extension is being provided for in the order that's before the committee today. And in addition to that, any action that follows or arises out of that is the subject of itself of consultation. And there is therefore the protection for, for Parliament, uh, well, there's the protection of a consultation, and there's then the protection of parliamentary scrutiny and parliamentary decision-making on any of these orders as a consequence. But Parliament, I think the crucial point is that Parliament has itself legislated for this provision uh, five years ago. And the, the Therefore, the judgment was made by Parliament this was an appropriate power to have. Um, and I think the exercise of that power, the history of the exercise of that power, has been entirely consistent with what I said to Parliament at the time would be the case. Thank you. OK, Gavin, to be followed by Malcolm. Thanks, Thanks um, Cabinet Secretary, over the last uh, five years, if there have been any significant changes to the public sector landscape, you indicated that you've used primary legislation to do it. Is, is there a, if, if this order is passed today, is there a firm government commitment to continue in that vein so that any um, significant changes to public sector landscape, should there be any, will still be through primary legislation and you would use these powers in a broadly similar way to the way you've used them over the last five years? Uh, uh, I, I would use the power, I would propose to use the powers in an entirely similar way to the way, and the, the, I think the key point in addressing Mr Brown's question is that the exercise of these powers 
has been entirely consistent with what I told Parliament in the run-up to the passage of the legislation in 2010. Um, so I'm very happy to confirm that um, our actions going forward would be entirely consistent with what has happened in the last five years and entirely consistent with the explanation I, and assurances I gave Parliament five years ago. Um, when, one, I mean, one of the reasons the, the powers, I think, were sought initially by the, by the government and reviewing the various debates, this seems to back it up, was that there were changes envisaged to the public sector. We're going through, um, I guess, a period of reform uh, throughout the public sector. One of the arguments given by the government for having these powers was that it, because there was a huge amount of reform going on, um, they needed the ability to be fleet of foot, um, and it was thought that five years was, a, was an appropriate time. For, for how, I mean, this is, a, I suppose, not an easy question to answer, but do you, do you envisage these powers being held by government in perpetuity and just simply renewed every five years, or is your view that if this order is passed today, actually in five years' time, we probably won't have a need for such powers? Or do you, do you envisage this effectively uh, being renewed constantly? I, 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 you know, it is, it is me looking well into the future, but I think, the, I think the, the nature of the changes and the character of the changes that have been undertaken as a consequence of the use of these powers has been essentially... Um, for, for minor alterations to the landscape. And I think in the real world, those minor changes to the landscape are going to probably continue on an ongoing basis. And yes, there will be major elements of reform of the public uh, sector landscape in Scotland, but as Mr Brown quite rightly highlights from my earlier remarks, um, the government will bring forward those changes through um, primary legislation because they will require to have the extensive and full scrutiny that would be appropriate for such major changes. Um, but I, I, you know, without prejudging what the situation will be in five years' time, um, I, I would imagine there would still be a cause and a need for the minor alterations that we have undertaken through these powers uh, being taken forward in due course. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Malcolm, to follow by Richard. I mean, you said Parliament gave approval for this part of the bill, but, but surely Parliament gave approval for this part of the bill for five years. I mean, is there, irrespective of the merits of the case, uh, is there not an issue about the nature of a sunset clause and what Parliament's intention is when they insist on a sunset clause? I think that's correct, and that's precisely why the committee is considering an order to extend the... Um, the, the, the exercise of these powers for a further five-year period, um, which was prov you know, provision for which was made in the primary legislation. So I, I, I think the you know, Parliament has clearly provided for this to be the case. It can't happen automatically. It has to be the subject of parliamentary scrutiny and parliamentary consideration. And um, I think on the basis of the fact that the exercise of the powers has been undertaken entirely consistently with what I explained and proposed to Parliament five years ago, I think that gives the, the, the basis of the framework for parliamentary assurance on, on these questions. But would, would it have been such a big problem to consult? I mean, it may even have um, proved your case for you if all the people who were concerned would now just write in and say, it's fine, we haven't got a problem with this anymore. I mean, I suppose it's more the nature of uh, a sunset clause, is there not a requirement after five years to look at it afresh, given you've only been given that? And if you're looking at legislation afresh in the Scottish Parliament, you would normally consult on it. Um, I, th I think there's the, the issue um, for me is largely contained in the, in the way in which we've exercised these responsibilities. Um, you know, we, we have not... If I went back to look at some of the... The, 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 the points I was accused of wishing to take these powers for in 2010, um, you know, the evidence does not substantiate any of that argument that was put to Parliament at the time. So I, I feel that the issues were well rehearsed in 2010. Parliament made provision for an extension of these provisions um, if it so chose. And the manner and the basis of how these powers have been exercised, I think, is entirely consistent with uh, that approach. And therefore, um, we 
in a position where we can, uh, Parliament is able to take that decision today. I mean, have you looked at any precedents in terms of the treatment of sunset clauses in previous legislation? Uh, th there will be a variety of uh, different examples where um, th 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 there will be um, consultation will and will not have taken place. My judgment on this point was that um, it was a relatively uh, straightforward judgment to arrive at that um, the powers had been provided for, we had acted consistent with what we had said to Parliament and therefore there was a, a case for extending the powers in the, or making the case for extending the powers in the fashion that we have done so. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Richard, to followed by Jean. Thank you, Convener. Come, so you said that the powers have been used eight times over the past five years. Uh, do you have expectations to be used more frequently or less frequently over the next five years in terms of those numbers? I, I, I think it's difficult to tell, but what I would say in response to Mr Baker's question is that we, I would envisage the powers being used for um, comparable circumstances. So whether it's once or 20 times, they would be for broadly minor changes to the public body's landscape, but in all circumstances, they would be consulted upon individually as a consequence of the taking forward of any orders under this particular power. So I can't, uh, I can't predict the, you know, I think the general point that uh, I think Mr Brown was, 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 was pursuing in his questions is that are we dealing with a, an entirely static public sector and public bodies landscape? Then the answer to that question is no, we will be facing changes and I would imagine um, we will have to make uh, changes on the basis of efficiency um, and economy as the bill provides for. Um, but as to providing a definitive view on how often I would imagine the provisions to be used, um, that's, um, that's not possible for me to do that at this stage. So potentially they could be used far more often over the next five years, depending on what the agenda is for public sector reform. And, and given that wouldn't have been a belt and braces approach to ensure that there was for the consultation at this point before we may embark on a period where they'll be actually be used more frequently than they were over, over the previous five years? No, because the, 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 the assurance to Parliament is the fact, and the, the point that I've put on the record in response to Mr Brown as well, is that um, the utilisation of these powers would be entirely consistent with the, the type of changes that we have made and the type of changes that we suggested uh, in the parliamentary debates in the run-up to the passage of the Public Services Reform Scotland Act in 2010. Final question. If in five years government comes forward to extend these powers again for another five years, do you think it would be acceptable at that point that they would say, once again, there's no need to consult on this provision, even then it would be ten years since the, the bill was originally passed? Well, that would be a judgment to be arrived at at the time. Uh, obviously, um, uh, ministers would have to, 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 to come to a view at that stage. But I think the basis of how we've um, taken forward this, um, this, uh, the exercise of this power, uh, I think, demonstrates that um, uh, we have remained entirely faithful to the commitments we gave to Parliament in 2010. Thank you. Jean? Uh, thank you, Convener. I mean, uh, my question, I suppose, really was answered by, uh, uh, in your answer to Mr Brown and Mr Chisholm about when does the sun set on a sunset close. Um, but given that uh, it, you have been the Cabinet Secretary and um, have, have clearly been very canny about using uh, this particular uh, legislation, is there any opportunity, do you think, if, God forbid, you were not the Cabinet Secretary, but there could be any abuse that, that would give members clearly there was an anxiety in the in the debate before which allowed them to do a kind of temporary fix mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think there is an opportunity for that for um, probably three reasons um, firstly the power would have to be exercised consistent with what I said to Parliament in the run up to the 2010 Act and I think a minister would really struggle frankly to sustain an argument if they were trying to undertake um, major reforms of the public sector landscape through this power, because that would exceed what I put on the parliamentary record in 2010. So there would be poor foundations to the argument that a minister could put forward. Um, secondly, the, uh, any individual instrument has to be the subject of separate 
distinctive consultation and parliamentary scrutiny. So there's protection in that respect. And then thirdly, um, there is now precedent, uh, because there is now five years of precedent where I think if a minister was to come forward with um, a more significant change that one might consider merited primary legislation, then um, the, the, the body of precedent would be against them in sustaining that argument. And indeed, in each of the provisions, and I think this relates to the core question of consultation the committee has wrestled with this morning, on every one of the orders that we have brought forward, which have been the subject to consultation, there would be the opportunity for stakeholders to say, this is a change that is being undertaken out with the spirit of the 2010 Act, and that's not been forthcoming. Um, so I think, for all of those reasons, I think there is an established practice about um, the nature of how these powers can be utilised and exercised, and ministers would, I think, would be unable to sustain an argument um, if they did not act consistent with those, um, those three elements that I've set out today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that has concluded uh, questions from uh, the committee, Cabinet Secretary. We now move to debate on motion S4M-13108. I invite the Cabinet Secretary formally to move the motion. Um, uh, move formally, Kavina. I now put the question on the motion. The question is that motion S4M-13108 uh, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Sorry? Are yes. we all agreed? Yes. Yes, we are agreed. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, the committee will now publish a short report uh, to the Parliament setting out our decision on the statutory instrument. Uh, I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary and suspend the meeting for a couple of minutes in order to change over witnesses.
today is to continue to take evidence as part of our inquiry into Scotland's fiscal framework. I therefore like to welcome to the meeting Professor Ronald MacDonald, Professor Michael Keating, Professor John Beath and Professor uh, David Bell. Uh, members have received briefing papers from our witnesses, so we'll go straight to questions from the committee. And uh, the normal uh, process here in the committee is I'll start with a few opening questions and... Um, and then we will uh, open up to uh, colleagues around the table. I mean, I'm sure you all know the drill. Um, what I would say, though, is if I ask a question to a specific um, member of the panel, please, if others wish to uh, comment on that question, uh, feel free to do so. Um, and we'll have a wee bit of interaction, hopefully, uh, among the panellists. So the first thing, um, first question is going to be uh, to yourself, Professor Beath, which is... Um, uh, in terms of your summary, you've said in your second paragraph, it is crucial that the process allows sufficient time for deliberative consultation. So the $64,000 question is, how much time? How much time? Yeah, for this process. Um, well, I would, um, if you're going to put a figure on it, I, I suppose one have, we'd have to say more than a year. Um, and the reason is, it's a very simple reason, and that is if you actually want to have an enduring settlement, you have to be sure you've got in place a fairly clear, robust uh, framework. And doing the, uh, developing these things inevitably takes time uh, because you need to consult with people. You need to test out uh, the framework in simulations to see whether or not something works as you think it might work or whether there's something that needs to be uh, uh, put, corrected. Now, if you suddenly jump into a framework and adopt it and six months down the line you find something goes wrong uh, you have a problem and I'm sure nobody wants that sort of problem that's, that's exactly why we say you, you need a proper uh, uh, process. Okay, before I let other panellists comment on that the, the point is of course, there's a couple of points Calman first uh, was proposed in December 2007 and some of the some of it's still not been ruled out yet completely um, and, you know, a, a vow was made in September of last year. There's been political commitments made to the electorate about uh, implementation timescales. Do you not feel, therefore, that um, if it was to go on a year, a lot of people would feel really disappointed? They would feel, I don't know, perhaps betrayed is too strong a word, but there'd be a real uh, backlash that the that promises made in terms of rolling out uh, additional powers, etc., were, were, were being uh, delayed inadvertently or well, deliberately? Well, there, there, there will always be... <coughs> Uh, some people who will be concerned about delay. Again, it's, it's how you explain the delay to them that, that matters, and I would have thought that um, uh, I go back to this, uh, this phrase that's uh, in, the, in the title of the document of ensuring that we've got an enduring settlement. And um, I, I think, uh, I think people, most people would realise that if that were explained to them, uh, that um, it made sense to make sure you've got all the pegs in place before you suddenly start playing the game. I would let others in, but I would comment, obviously, that then people will say, well, why was a promise made to deliver within a year if it, could, if it, it couldn't be delivered within a year? Professor Bell? Well, <coughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to go into the politics of this, but I, 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 do, I do agree with Professor Beath that uh, if this is to be an enduring settlement, there has to be um, in place... A, 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 a piece of legislation that will be uh, that makes sense, and a system, an administrative system in place that will be workable. Um, now, as you say, uh, 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 the um, arrangements for the uh, Scotland Act 2012 uh, are still not in place. Uh, I mean, there seems to be doubt about, still some doubt around the definition of Scottish taxpayers and not, no, ent well, no uh, complete clarity around, around the block grant adjustment mechanism. So it, it's, it may be difficult to explain to people that these things take time. It may be that it's possible to put in place uh, some kind of uh, uh, legislation uh, well in advance of the actual powers coming into force. Whether that would suffice I don't, uh, is difficult to say, but even legislation, it seems to me, has to be 
uh, thought very carefully before, before it's put on the statute book. And if it can be, do you think the fiscal framework should be agreed before the legislation is passed? Uh, I think so. I mean, there are huge questions of, uh, of detail here, and, and you, you want a situation, I, I would think, where um, there isn't opportunity for retrenchment post legislation being, being put in place. So what that means is a huge amount of work in a very short time, if it, it, and, and, and I would be wary of that. Thank you. Professor MacDonald or Professor Keating, do you wish to comment at all? Yeah, well, yes, I, mean, I probably concur with what my colleagues are saying. I, I think if you look at the process, a lot of this has been done in the hoof, if I may say so. Um, I mean, the work that um, Paul Hallwood and I did on, on fiscal autonomy going way back to, to the early 2000s, uh, we were making the case then very strongly for uh, some form of fiscal devolution, fiscal autonomy, uh, but in our work, we have an interesting little model, which is the threat of secession model. And uh, in that, we predict that the um, enhanced devolution powers that we're going to see will come about once we see threats of secession. And that is exactly how I think the process has been. And so it's, it's really not been uh, done, I believe, on a, if it can call it a scientific basis. Um, I think the key... Uh, element that people have focused on is trying to address the vertical imbalance or the fiscal gap. And where we are now, we seem to have moved quite a lot in that direction. But more generally, I don't think there's been a proper discussion of, well, what framework do the, do the, uh, does Scottish government need to implement its policies? And, and I think that is um, part of the problem at the moment. That, well, what do we need? What is the optimal mix of, of taxes, tax devolution, um, expenditure devolution, how is that financed in terms of borrowing and so on, uh, these are things you can't decide very quickly because they're, they're all kind of other consequences, some of which I mentioned in my uh, submission about what happens to uh, prices and competitiveness within a monetary union uh, where you've got devolved uh, taxes. There, there are lots and lots of issues here which have not even begun to be discussed. And uh, so I would uh, caution, that, you know, I, I would suggest we proceed with caution because we've got to get it right. If we don't get it right, then um, the consequences for the electorate could, could, in my view, be much, much worse than uh, going ahead with something that's, you know, not properly thought through. Okay, Professor Keating. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know what the constitutional status of the vow was, but it was produced very late in the campaign when 20% of the people had already voted. And at the election, all the parties said that they would implement it. So that's, that's hardly a mandate. It's hardly as though it was something that became part of the referendum campaign or the subsequent general election campaign. But things have changed since the general election that we've now got a, a majority conservative government that seems to be committed to reducing the scope and size of the state over the long term uh, as a percentage of GDP, if not in absolute terms. Scotland voted very differently. Uh, if the trends in, in, in England particularly continue as at present, we may see a radical restructuring of the state. It's very difficult to see any majority in this parliament going along in that direction. So the question would be here, whether in Scotland we want to continue to consume as much by way of public services and less by way of private consumption than is the preference in England. Uh, and if we do, then do we want to pay that for that by taxation or, or by charging, whether it's university fees or prescription charges or, or whatever? If we do, then there are implications for the level and types of taxation. Now, all the proposals that have come forward for devolution of taxes either assume that we're going to have broadly the same mix and, and size of public services in Scotland as in England, and I'm suggesting that may not be the case, uh, or else they've been tied to proposals for cutting taxes, which goes exactly the opposite direction from what I'm suggesting, that maybe in Scotland if there is a political preference for more public services, then the level of taxation would have to be higher. Uh, and if we accept that, then it has huge implications for what kinds of taxes and whether we have a broad base of taxation and whether we have taxes that are buoyant and when we have taxes that can actually be used. And I don't think the Smith Commission meets any of those 
requirements. So we need really to go back to first principles and think through it again. And that will take us uh, a year, two years at, at least. But we've got a, a five-year parliament at, at Westminster. We've got the Scottish elections coming up next year, which uh, is going to be an important thing, and, and which is going to make it even more difficult to try and get this thing through fast. So I think, I think we've got time to try and get this right, and it would be a mistake to rush through the Smith proposals now, because we will certainly have to revisit them again before too long. I think the panel's views on that issue are quite uh, uh, clear. Uh, I will call you wish to explore uh, further. Uh, continuing with the RAC, uh, Professor B, you, you talked about uh, the need to establish fiscal institutions that can provide independent and rigorous analysis and review. And you say uh, that the RAC is firmly of the view that there is a need to establish in Scotland an independent fiscal body to provide authoritative and independent forecasts of the future fiscal revenues and budget positions. Where do you feel the Scottish Fiscal Commission fits in with that framework? Well, uh, I would have thought it's, uh, if you're looking for something to build on, uh, uh, the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a brick in place at the moment, uh, which is the Scottish Fiscal Commission. It's very small. It's, um, uh, it, it, it's not particularly well resourced, I don't think. Um, and it certainly doesn't have the capability to conduct the sorts of exercises and analysis uh, and scrutiny of, um, of, of policy that um, uh, uh, would seem to be necessary if one has to have you know, proper independent, uh, almost auditing of, uh, of what goes on. Uh, I mean, I, I think the, uh, we've, we mentioned that the, uh, uh, a, a very useful model might be something like the Congressional Budget Office in the United States, uh, that is a well-resourced um, organisation, does extraordinarily good work. It may be possible that uh, uh, somehow one could uh, do some mixing of uh, the Fiscal Commission and SPICE. I don't know. That's not something I'm an expert on. But I'd have thought, I, thought, I, I think there are bits in place, but for it, the, whole, the, the, the building isn't. There are, there are some foundations piles there, but you need a whole building in place uh, uh, to carry out this kind of exercise. Uh, just for clarification, whether the Scottish Fiscal Commission should be expanded or, or replaced, or there should be a parallel body, how do you, where do you see it fitting in? Well, your uh, all, what I would have, what I would recommend uh, uh, would be that it's, it should be a properly independent body, and that's all that I. Uh, at the moment, because um, the people are on this fiscal well, commission I'm, are pretty um, vigorous in their defence in terms of being an independent body, but you, you don't believe that I, that's the case? Well, I, perhaps, perhaps I, uh, I, I'm sure it is independent. I, think, I don't think that, that's an issue, but I, 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 think, I think it just needs, it, it needs to be um, larger, rather more permanent in the way it meets and mm -hmm. debate. I mean, I think that's the, it's, 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 it's sort of having something like an OBR or something in place. That's it, it, and it's not that. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Uh, colleagues on the table, um, Professor Keating, do you have a view on that, that issue? Well, well I, I think the fiscal commission is, is critical for technical reasons to get the data out there, and also for political reasons that it is independent and seen to be independent of, of, of both governments, and this this this, this makes a, a, a huge difference, and that it should be able to. Uh, initiate inquiries on its own. It shouldn't simply review the Scottish Government's forecast, but should have a more proactive role uh, itself. And for that, it's, it's very important that it should be responsible directly to the Parliament, not, not to the Government. And I think the Congressional Budget Office, which of course is a, is a much bigger operation than this would, would ever be, but I think it's a useful model because of its uh, statutory independence. Yeah, I think a cabinet secretary of a heart attack if he thought it would be as big as, uh, as, big as a, a CBO. But, um, but I, I take on board your, your comments on that. Uh, Professor MacDonald? Yeah, just to echo what colleagues have been saying, I think the, the uh, Fiscal Commission needs to be bolstered. It needs, obviously, as people have been saying, to be independent. But it is a bit of a shoestring budget at the moment, so I think more resource has to be devoted to it. I think it has to do its own forecasting and not rely on um, Scottish Government forecasts. Uh, because only then will it become independent um, or be seen to be independent. But therein lies another, <clears throat> another detail that, um, you know, we really need to improve our data uh, 
in, in, in Scottish Government. Uh, I know that uh, steps are being made now to, to improve the GDP data, but as I understand, we don't have proper price data, we don't have proper breakdowns of price data. So it's, it's very difficult to see how these guys could do their job properly if, if we don't have a really good, good data set. And so I think we need to be putting resources uh, that way as, as well. And in terms of this question, I'd love to kept you to the end here, Professor Bell, because you've obviously got a section on data specifically in your paper, and you, you touch on the SNAP project, which committed to evidence on, uh, or, or asked questions about uh, uh, last week. And uh, you, you say that we need to identify where improvements might be made in both accuracy and timing. So in terms of Scottish Fiscal Commission, do you feel it should be beefed up um, considerably? Uh, or as I asked uh, Professor Beath, you know, should it, be a, should it be a separate body? Should it be a, uh, whatever? Can you provide clarification on that? And in terms of how the data can be improved, because that's obviously an issue of concern for the committee in terms of going forward. Uh, so the <coughs> Fiscal Commission, I, I go along with uh, my colleagues, uh, not only has it to, to be independent, it has to be seen to be independent, and perceptions really matter uh, in, in, this, uh, in this respect. I think the OBR um, now is accepted as, uh, you know, to be an independent uh, body, but there was quite a lot of suspicion around, around it in its early days. And I don't think that we necessarily in Scotland need to go down the same uh, route as, as has happened uh, in uh, Westminster in relation to the construction of, the, uh, of the, uh, it, that independent body. The key thing is that it's independent and it carries out um, a set of functions that <coughs> are appropriate for whatever uh, uh, um, Scotland's fiscal framework uh, is going to be, and I go along with the idea that uh, a, a body uh, located in the Parliament would carry a, a great deal of weight. Um, <clears throat> it seems to me that um, you know there are other uh, models in Germany. We have the wise men in different in different in, uh, universities who, who effectively provide the the fiscal. Um, uh, oversight of uh, of, of uh, German fiscal policy, but uh, but the Office of Budget Responsibility has got a long and and distinguished history. So there must be something there that that uh, that could be worth uh, looking at. Uh, I think in my paper too, uh, uh, the, whatever the body is, it will have to work quite closely with the OBR, because if you think about, for example, the block grant adjustment. The way that the block grant adjustment is going to work relates to the relative rate of growth in tax revenue, ta the tax base in Scotland and England and the rest of the UK. So you, you have to take the, somebody's forecast or develop your own view about how fast the rest of the UK economy is growing before you can forecast Scottish budget, the Scottish budget. So, you know, that in itself is, it obviously requires a degree of uh, a interaction with uh, uh, the uh, uh, body south of the border. In terms of uh, data, I mean, immediately in relation to the new powers, it does seem to me to be very important to improve the kind of information that we have around uh, tax, the tax base, um, tax revenues, um, one small point, for example, is the importance of understanding the 1%. The 1% are the top uh, income earners who, I think, um, uh, um, supply around 11% of total income tax revenues. And really, there aren't all that many of them. Uh, so if income tax is to be the key part of Scotland's uh, uh, fiscal structure, then, then understanding how um, taxes... Uh, uh, tax revenues uh, are, are generated by whom is, is extremely important. And we're going to have to, we have some experience of that, but then we're, we're also going to have to learn a lot more about welfare benefits. Uh, DWP do have a lot of statistics on welfare benefits and there will be, it seems to me, a need for some institutional agreement with DWP about how these are accessed uh, and, um, and, and for what purposes uh, uh, they are used. So that, I mean, 
that is a minimum in terms of, uh, of data requirements because it focuses just on the new powers. But then behind that, you've got all of the other macro type uh, uh, variables that the SNAP project has tried to address. And, and we need them uh, in a more timely fashion. And we need them uh, um, with a degree of, um, uh, well, that we're satisfied around the degree of accuracy that, uh, that, that uh, is embodied in them. And I, I, funnily enough, yesterday I was looking at some of, you know, uh, estimates of Scotland's gross operating surplus, which is part of the SNAP project. And it's based on lots and lots of assumptions. And, you know, their, their <laughs> assumptions aren't always correct. So you, 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 to some extent, you pays your money and it takes your chance. Yeah, the more assumptions the hazard is to get, a, yeah. to get an accurate um, uh, res result in the end. Um, moving on to, to your paper, um, Professor uh, MacDonald, you say um, uh, uh, on the issue of Barnet, uh, you say that uh, once the block grant has been decided, um, following all the changes we've kind of touched on, and um, absent a no detriment uh, clause, it may be possible to use a method of indexation to adjust the block grant moving forward. Uh, I'm wondering if you have any views on what form that indexation could take um, or should take. Um, well, one idea I proposed uh, a while back was you, you could maybe look at the economic cycle within Scotland and perhaps uh, you could index it in terms of GDP movements relative to some, some base. Um, but I, I think the important point I would make is that um, there would need to be some reform of Barnet. So we, we are talking about a, a revised version of Barnet, some kind of block grant, which presumably we would uh, still need going, going forward. Um, and that may be in terms of the, um, you know, one, one idea I had in the current paper is to have something along the lines of the Australian Grants Commission where they uh, basically on a year-by-year -year basis, they, um, the various components, the various regional components in Australia put in bids for their desired um, spending and the, um, the commission has to either agree or deny these unanimously. If it denies them, then they use a simple uh, GDP rule along the lines of what I mentioned earlier to mechanistically roll it forward. But that perhaps isn't the, the optimum way of doing it if the desired uh, spend of the Scottish Parliament is, is different to that rule. Yeah, I, mean, I think the whole idea and you no know, detriment you've also touched on is that uh, you know, once uh, everything settles down, if the Scottish... Uh, if the Scottish economy grows uh, above the UK average, then the benefit would accrue to Scotland. If not, then Scotland would take the hit on that. And it's looking at a mechanism which effectively allows that to happen uh, without other kind of factors kind of um, a, a, a coming into play. Um, so that, that's the kind of thing I think we're, we're trying to wrestle with. And we've got a couple of presentations on our away day which show how difficult that would be. Mm. Um, Professor Keating, you were at that away day, I think. Um, have you got views on this particular issue? On the uh, yes, I think but Barnet does need to be addressed. But then we've been saying that for the best part of 40 years. and <laughs> I've been around all that time talking about it. But it's becoming really problematic because it's doing too many things that are not really consistent. One is it's, is it's providing revenue, it's making up revenue not raised by taxes in Scotland. Uh, it's also supposed to be, according to some versions, an equalisation mechanism, but it's not. It never was. It's a counter-cyclical mechanism to cope with asymmetric shocks that, so that Scotland is not dependent on its own revenues if there's a downturn in the Scottish economy. Uh, and these are all very different things. And it's these basic principles about what it's supposed to be doing that then are reflected in the individual problems that we generate when we're trying to talk about indexation and so on and become very technical. But it's a problem of principle. And the various proposals, the Smith proposals and so on, say, well, we'll continue Barnet. Bar Barnet's never been defined. Barnet's whatever the Treasury says Barnet is. Uh, they didn't even use the Treasury of Barnet. It was invented by our colleague David Heal, the phrase. And Lord Barnet immediately said, don't, call, don't put my name to it. Uh, and then it's just thrown around as though it, it really meant something. Uh, 
And whatever we get after Smith is not going to be Barnett in the recognizable sense. It's going to be something else. So maybe we should have a, a, a different name. And that would get us away from this incubus of thinking that it's just going to be the same thing. And then talking about Barnett also gets in the way of talking about other kinds of things. Because as long as we just tweak Barnett, which is essentially driven by changes in expenditure in England, although there are other things now overlaying upon that, then uh, we can't talk about all kinds of, of, of other things and, and about Scottish expenditure in a coherent way as being something other than derivative of decisions taken in England. And this pops up again in the debate about English votes for English laws or English votes for English taxes. And so we can't do this, we can't do that because of Barnett. So Barnett's almost become the foundation stone upon which everything else is built. And that's really very unfortunate. So we, we have to close off all kinds of things just, just because of Barnett. Now, it's immensely difficult to reform Barnett uh, because we'd have then to agree on, on, on other principles. Uh, but I think it would be better to face up to those issues head on uh, rather than pretend that it's still Barnett and keep on tweaking it in all sorts of complicated ways. And the experience of other countries when trying to do this is that it's a mixture of technical formulas, equalization settlements, and a fair dose of politics. That's the reality, of course. Uh, but it would be useful, nevertheless, to lay down some principles, to try and get agreement on the principles, although we know that there's going to be a lot of political haggling, and that what we'll end up with is somewhere between where we are now and where we'd ideally like to be. But simply muddling through, I think, is not, is not good enough. Uh, it's also causing immense irritation in other parts of the United Kingdom, where Barnett is, is interpreted again in yet another way as, as something that just benefits Scotland. It's a very misleading interpretation, but that's the interpretation uh, in other parts of the United Kingdom. So at some point, I think that really has got to be addressed if we're going to have a, a stable settlement. Okay, thank you very much for that answer. Professor uh, Bell, you want to comment on... No, I, uh, just to agree with that last point, and I guess that's the, perhaps the main point that the Royal Society... Um, document uh, is making that we really need to, and, and, and again it's an argument for taking a longer time but we really need a set of principles around sh uh, risks that are shared uh, across the whole of the UK and risks that are going to be dealt with on a, on a Scottish basis uh, uh, specifically and whatever is in Smith there aren't many principles well, thank you for that. Um, Professor B, actually, I've kept you to the end in, this, in terms of this question because you've obviously got quite a comprehensive section here in Barnet. You say, for example, in the REC paper, there's a need to reconsider the use of the Barnet formula as a basis for determining the fiscal relationships. Although, of course, we've just fought an election which all, all political parties are committed to retaining um, um, Barnet. Um, you, also, you also say that the principle of needs-based funding means revenue support should be allocated on the basis of some proper assessment of need. So I'd be interested in how, how your view that that would impact on Scotland. And then you say that, uh, finally, before I let, you, I let you come in, uh, should the block grant continue to be determined through the operation of the Barnett formula, there must be a mechanism through which the UK and Scottish governments can negotiate and agree on adjustments in an open and transparent manner. It's certainly not acceptable for HM Treasury as an organ of the UK government to make such decisions unilaterally. So, yeah. Professor um, Yes, well, I, I, I think um, it's... Uh, fairly clear that um, uh, as we've moved, as we're moving into a much more complicated uh, set of devolution relationships with Wales and Northern Ireland as well to think about, um, that uh, there really does need to be uh, a fundamental rethink of the way in which uh, revenues and expenditures are shared. And um, uh, we would, um, it, it's, uh, you know, that, that's why you have, to, you, you have to sit down and think about what risks are best uh, carried at a national level, at a UK-wide level, what risks uh, are best carried at a local level. There's also the issue of um, the, the question of um, fairness. Uh, so uh, what, what, one wants fair outcomes. Now, fair out, a fair outcome might, for example, be a system in which when there are unexpected negative shocks in one part of the economy, that a part, another part of the economy, which is where that, these, these are not present, essentially makes transfer resources. And the, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of sharing, you know, fiscal sharing relationship that I think uh, uh, you, you want to try and uh, have it in your mind. And the, the, the actual 
structure and mechanisms uh, are matters for determination by experts. I'm not an, an expert on the workings of the Barnett formula and other types of uh, you know, financial tran transfer mechanisms, but there are plenty of expertise out there uh, on, the, on my left and on my right. <laughs> uh, and I think that's all I would want to say in answer to your question. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to allow colleagues to ask questions also, obviously, so I'm just going to ask one final point, and it's uh, with regard to your own paper, Professor Bell. It's just about the tax gap. I mean, you've talked about, um, you know, we, uh, the new fiscal body, which we'll discuss, should be perhaps be asked to monitor Scotland's tax gap, um, which is the difference between tax collected and that which HMRC's view should be collected. And you've said in your previous paper, you suggested uh, in 2007-8, the potential shortfall in self-assessment is about £550 million. I'm just wondering why um, this gap is so large, if it's identifiable, and what can be done, uh, what mechanisms are put in place so that both governments north and south of the border can reduce this gap? I think this is um, um, the uh, so-called you know, tightening of um, tax uh, avoidance. Um, issue uh, and the HMRC estimate is you know has been out there for some time um, the trouble part of the trouble uh, around this is that politicians are always willing to say in the run-up to an election that they're going to shore up their finances by reducing tax avoidance and then that tends not to happen. It's quite difficult, basically, when you've got a very, very complex tax system uh, to uh, ensure that you get 100% compliance with what you think are the, uh, uh, is the, taxable in the aggregate taxable income that's, uh, uh, that's out there. One of the things, uh, there's a, a, a paper out in the last few days is that this suggests that this, the effort put in to tax avoidance increases with the topmost rate of tax. Uh, so that um, increasing the top rate will not, will not result in the increase in revenues that, that might have been expected because people will put more effort into tax avoidance. It's a, a tax avoidance is 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 always a choice, and you 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 weigh up the costs and the benefits of uh, of tax avoidance. And the greater the benefits, then the more you're likely to uh, to go for it. And of course, in a complex tax system, it isn't. You know, there tend to be ways round um, uh, regulations that al allow you to put money in different forms, uh, which. Uh, 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 the taxman can't. The taxman can't access. So I don't have a you know a, a, an immediate solution to this problem, but uh, uh, clearly, I mean, one of the issues that will that may be created uh, as a result of the the uh, new taxes is that um, it'll be possible to pay, pay uh, to play off the authorities north and south of uh, of the border. In relation to uh, to uh, 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 your tax um, liabilities, I'm almost tempted to uh, ask Professor McEwen, who's a tax expert himself and our committee advisor, but he is not on our witness panel. So I'll move on to uh, any other members of the panel wish to comment. And I know you were writing down some notes, Professor Beavers. Could I just say yes. something that uh, uh, there's actually some. Uh, very interesting research going on at the University of Exeter uh, in conjunction with the University of Kent. Uh, there is a thing called the Tax Administration Research Centre uh, led by Professor Miles. And what they've been doing uh, is trying to use the insights of behavioural economics and testing these uh, out through ex field experiments to try and find methods by which the tax gap might be closed. Uh, and I think there's, there's, potential, there's some pot potentially very interesting things there, such as how do you pre-populate tax forms? Are, are there certain things you could fill in in advance that would encourage people to tell the truth? So I think there's some, there is some very interesting, potentially some very interesting work out there. Okay, Professor Bell. 
in relation to that, actually, that I was at a, a meeting last week where Mr. Swinney was, uh, was talking about responsible taxation, and KPMG are, are, are promoting this, this approach as, as one of the major accountancy firms, uh, and we discussed the joy of tax. That was one of the, the uh, uh, dinner's um, uh, topics for discussion. Uh, but essentially, there, there are, as, uh, as Professor Beath implies, one of the ways of getting at this issue may be around uh, using um, or finding behaviours that, uh, uh, that people feel it's... Uh, it's not uh, appropriate to go in for elaborate tax avoidance schemes. Okay. It didn't happen to be some bloke with long kind of straggly hair and a kind of <laughs> unkempt beard or anything like that <laughs> in this uh, Joy of Tax seminar. <laughs> no. um, Professor MacDonald, do you want to comment on that at all? Or? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I'm now going to open up the session and the first person to ask questions will be Mark. Thank you, convener. Um, wanted to touch, first of all, on the issue of no detriment, because it appears in, in some of the papers that are before us. And um, the RSE submission, I think, makes a, a, a very compelling case, and certainly on the basis of the evidence that has been received both by this committee and also at the Devolution and Further Powers Committee, of which I'm also a member, would suggest that there are a number of interpretations of the no detriment principle out there. Uh, I note... Um, in, in the submission, the RSE says there's a pressing need for a comprehensive and independent analysis of how it will apply in practice. And I look at a, a group of learned individuals sitting before us and wonder why, why has that not yet happened? And is it something that, that organisations such as the RSE or, or, or others may wish to undertake? Because I think it would be of great benefit to, to the committees of this parliament in terms of scrutinising how it will work in practice thought that the um, it's almost certainly a question which is under active consideration in the Institute for Fiscal Studies uh, and I would have thought that that might be uh, the place to look for the people who've got the full-time expertise to to go into this um, I mean there, there are it, uh, the no detriment uh, condition I mean there t there's no detriment one and there's no detriment two that the no detriment one is essentially uh, uh, a balanced budget constraint at, at the aggregate level, uh, other things remaining equal, that is, if nothing changed and you devolved powers, that the total budgets across the devolved and national things should be unchanged. I call that, I call that a zero budget condition. Um, but um, the rather more tricky one is, of course, no detriment two, which is uh, that um, uh, if there are spillovers, then there needs to be some kind of compensatory mechanism put in place. Now, measuring spillovers is one problem. What is the, what is the appropriate sort of, I mean, if you find them, how, how do you then uh, decide on a compensatory mechanism? Um, and that, that is something that certainly uh, is, uh, requires quite a lot of uh, detailed research to work, that, to work these out, to identify the spillovers, measure their scale, and to decide a way in which uh, they are corrected. Mm -hmm. Do any of the other, uh, Professor Bell and then yeah. Professor Key? Just to add to that, um, it's the second part of the no detriment <coughs> principles that I think does cause um, considerable uh, uh, problems. Um, um, University of Stirling is currently, uh, along with the Institute for Fiscal Studies, got a grant application into. Uh, the Nuffield Foundation to look at uh, precisely this issue. I can think of it in terms of um, a, a reasonably complex econometric model, but I wouldn't have the data or anything like the data necessary to calculate the second round, the third round, the fourth round effects, which could be argued to be part of, if you were taking the full uh, no detriment um, uh, or full implication of the second part of the of the uh, no detriment uh, uh, clauses. Uh, so um, we'd like to uh, address this issue. We realise it's very complex, and that's yet another reason why there's a need for for some time. Mm 
to, uh, uh, to, to come to some kind of satisfactory uh, solution. I, do, I mean, I think there's a problem in, in the sense that some reactions might well be market reactions. Uh, and, and, and you say that the, 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 the response of a market may have caused a detriment elsewhere. Well, you know, that's how, mar that, that's how markets operate. And, 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 and so therefore, where you draw the line about where detriment starts and finishes also seems extremely difficult. So, so presumably you're saying that, that one of the difficulties that could be faced under this is, is correctly apportioning cause and effect. Yeah. Because what, what appears on the face value to perhaps be a policy decision that leads to a certain outcome may actually be somewhat more complex than that and could lead to difficulties in determining whether detriment has in fact been caused. Absolutely. That's absolutely uh, correct, it seems to me. Okay. Professor Keating, you yeah, want to respond? There's a, a narrow and a broad definition of detriment, it seems to me. Uh, and the narrow one is <coughs> changes in taxation expenditure that have a direct implication for the other jurisdiction, most of which are in welfare, say the nexus of housing policy devolved, welfare policy reserved. You can do things that increase the UK welfare bill or reduce the welfare bill. There's also a suggestion in some of the papers that there's a complement to detriment, which is benefit, that if you do something that benefits the other jurisdiction, you could get something back. So if you provide more social housing and reduce the housing benefit bill coming from the, the uh, UK government, then you, you should be rewarded for that. Uh, and we can model those when it comes to things around uh, public expenditure and direct impacts. There was a few years ago the argument about free personal care for the elders, the implications for attendance allowances and the Scottish Government saying we should get that money back because we've saved you money. But it's the, it's the broader one that is really difficult because that gets us into things like tax competition. And if we cut air passenger duty here and flights are diverted from Newcastle Airport to Edinburgh Airport, uh, or if fracking is banned in Scotland and therefore revenues are foregone by the Treasury that it would have got, that becomes extremely difficult and, and it seems to be an excessive interpretation. But some interpretations go that way. And then we've looked at other countries and we found various instances where detrimental action is not allowed as a triggering mechanism and an intergovernmental conference or things go to the courts. We've not found a single case anywhere in the world where detriment is allowed but compensation is required. And I don't know where that came from because we haven't found an example anywhere where, where that particular uh, solution has, has, has been adopted. Just before I see if Professor McDonald wants to, to contribute, one of the points you made there about benefit, um, there has been some suggestion as well of how exactly would detriment be measured? Would it be measured simply on, uh, could it be measured on the basis that if decisions were taken that uh, allowed for um, benefits to be accrued in uh, say in Scotland but not in our UK or indeed vice versa, would that constitute a, a, a consequential detriment essentially? Um, could, could that be construed? So do, do you think that what really needs to happen is within the fiscal framework there needs to be a very clear uh, outlining of what exactly no detriment would mean and how it would be uh, measured and then uh, addressed and perhaps Professor MacDonald you might want to lead off on that <coughs> point because it strikes me as well that one of the difficulties here is that often um, some of the data that might be required to determine detriment, it may not come into, uh, into the, the, the knowledge for, for two years, perhaps more after the event. And how then do you then compensate for a decision or, or, or an action that, that is historic in that respect? Yeah, um, I just under, uh, I just reinforce what my colleagues have been saying. It is it is very very complex. You need uh, data. We need to work out uh, counterfactuals, as, as you're saying. Um, and you know, if we've got the data, I'm sure we 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 can do that. But it's not clear where we are at the moment that we've got the tools to properly work out these repercussions, which could, as you say, be long lasting. And for me, it just underscores what we said earlier. <coughs> excuse me, that um, I think we do need time uh, and probably a year is not enough time to, uh, to get, get these uh, issues right because, um, for one thing, as I say, you need, you need, need reasonably good data. Uh, you need to build models. Um, you know, as Professor Bell was saying, that's an ongoing thing with the Institute of Fiscal Studies. That all takes uh, considerable time. And then actually understanding what's going on 
in the models and in the data takes uh, takes more time. Okay. Just to move, to, to move on slightly, and um, the issue around tax competition has been raised, and one of the points that, that I've pursued through, through a number of evidence sessions is around the way that the budget processes work in the two administrations. So in Scotland, um, I think we've seen this most starkly with the LBTT stamp duty, um, where uh, in Scotland the, the approach that is taken is to consult on rates, is to consult on the, the budgetary process. And at Westminster, the long-standing tradition has been essentially the rabbit out of the hat approach, that the Chancellor will stand up at the dispatch box and will uh, produce a, a tax change that affects at midnight that evening. Um, do you foresee that uh, I mean, the, the evidence we've received would suggest it's unlikely that's going to change, but would you foresee that in the background, uh, the, the fiscal framework and the intergovernmental relationships are going to have to change in order to avoid that kind of approach being taken when there are certainly more substantial uh, tax levers uh, being devolved than, than LBTT stamp duty was? Um, Perhaps, Professor Bell, you'd want to lead on that. So uh, there is quite a literature on, on tax competition uh, where, where two authorities have uh, a, effectively the power to uh, uh, set taxes but on the same tax base. And the difficulty is the um, possibility that the general populace is overtaxed as a result of both governments trying to extract as much as they can from that uh, uh, tax base. So your question, though, is about the process. Uh, and it seems to me that, um, and, and this is a general point, I guess, about uh, quite a lot of the things, there has to be more intergovernmental cooperation or formal mechanisms for intergovernmental cooperation uh, in order to um, come to a more satisfactory situation, I guess, uh, you know, given that uh, Mr. Swinney normally uh, announces or, or w will announce towards the end of the year the, uh, the Scottish rate of income tax, and then the UK government will announce uh, uh, what... Uh, the basic rate and, uh, and upper rates and so on will be at the time of the budget, then uh, there's a first mover disadvantage here in that um, the Scottish government has put its bid in place and the UK government may, may just ignore as far as Scotland is concerned because nine-tenths of the revenues will come from the rest of the UK which may leave the Scottish Government in a difficult position, as indeed it did with the, the land and building transaction tax. So I guess you want a mechanism that avoids this possibility, possibly in the background rather than, than, than something formal. There are reasons why sometimes taxes should be announced and then be in, in place by midnight to, to uh, 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 maximise tax revenue. But nevertheless, it, it does seem to me that, again, there's a, there's a need to think through what um, formal or informal mechanism has to be put in place so that, uh, I wouldn't say tax competition is minimised, but that there's an understanding in, uh, in, in both uh, governments uh, as to the uh, likely overall uh, uh, amount of uh, a tax that is going to be taken out of this pool of taxable income. Professor Reith? Nothing to add to that. Yeah, there's also in, in the literature the so-called race to the bottom hypothesis, which suggests under taxation as a result of tax competition because jurisdictions are trying to attract businesses and wealthy individuals by cutting tax uh, rates. And, and the evidence of this is really quite mixed because it depends on the circumstances. There's a lot of this in the United States where people and businesses are very mobile. There's quite a lot of evidence of this in Switzerland, which is a small place, and distances involved in relocation are fairly small, so you can live in one place and work in another place. 
uh, they, it depends on what kind of taxes you're talking about. Uh, there is a danger of tax competition in, in business taxation, and as a result of that, many devolved and federal systems have been trying to harmonize business taxation to avoid that. In Canada, there's been a trend towards trying to equalize business taxation, even while other taxation rates are, are diverging. And even in France, which we think of as a very centralized country, local government actually did tax businesses, and, and that's been more or less eliminated to avoid these kinds of distortions. It's less of a problem in personal taxation, although David has mentioned the problem of wealthy individuals, but generally speaking, that's less of a problem because there are other reasons for living in a particular place because you're working there and you have a family and other ties to a place. Uh, and it's least of all a problem when it comes to land and, and property taxation because land and property is not easily movable, uh, and which gives me the opportunity to mention that something that really belongs in this debate is local taxation and property taxation, which the Scottish Parliament already has. It's, it's an important part of, of, of the mix. Uh, and there are opportunities. I know there is a commission looking at this in Scotland at the moment, but that's going to be something that's got to be taken into consideration when thinking about the broad range of taxes in Scotland, income tax, assigned taxes, the minor taxes, but uh, land and property taxation is important as well. Okay, uh, perhaps one, one final question, and that is, um, uh, Professor MacDonald, in your, in your paper you, you mentioned the... Um, what you see as an overemphasis on deficit and debt targets and an underemphasis on economic growth targets. And Professor Keating spoke about the, the divergence, if you will, in terms of the political debates that were had and the, the electoral outcomes that were had, where it seems as though the, 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 pr the electoral preference in, in, in England uh, was for a continuation around that deficit debt uh, discussion, but in Scotland seem to be more about the economic growth and use of uh, fiscal powers to, to grow the economy and perhaps address things that way. Do you see a, a means by which, with, for example, borrowing powers, tax powers coming to Scotland, the, the fiscal framework would allow for those divergent approaches to perhaps be taken? I mean, I realise it, would, it wouldn't be absolute, but there, there is potential for, for different approaches to be taken. Yes, um, it potentially could, of course, um, but I think there, there is that potential available at the moment because um, I think one of the things I was getting at in, in, in these comments was that the, certainly in terms of the UK position, <coughs> where, as you say, deficit reduction is the, the key focus of, of macroeconomic policy at the moment, um, my concern is how robust the, um, the recovery that we're seeing at the moment actually is. My concern is that we're simply returning to a situation where much of the recovery is dependent on private sector consumption and on uh, the property market, um, when in fact we should be uh, trying to improve productivity in the UK as a whole, but also in Scotland. We've got very poor productivity rates at the moment, and all of the contributing factors to these productivity indicators are, are poor as, as well. For example, our R&D spend in the UK is lamentable, and it's the same story in Scotland. So I'm not sure that um, simply changing the, the, the tax structure gives you any um, value added in, in addressing some of these issues. I think... Um, it's, it's, it's important to have these as objectives and then find ways of, um, you know, of, of improving these. Uh, and I think there are tools available at the moment which would allow governments in Scotland and the rest of the UK to do that. Mm -hmm. I guess the, the, the point I'm making is that we're looking at the fiscal framework that's going to be established, and that will obviously uh, has the potential to, to be um, both liberating or constraining, depending on how the, the rules within it are, are drawn up and... and what would you see as the opportunities for a fiscal framework to allow for that, that difference of approach to be taken? Well, if a fiscal framework allows, uh, you know, if you've got a broader range of taxes to, at your disposal, then you can trade off uh, one tax against another. You can trade off uh, spending against other forms of spending. But um, I don't think there's any magic or silver bullet in, in tax changes because... I mean, for example, in terms of poor productivity performance, 
Uh, we know that, for example, in the Scottish context, there, there was a preference for uh, diverting funds from higher education uh, units towards the university sector, which has perhaps had implications for um, productivity in, in, in Scotland. So there, there are lots of things uh, that you can do with the, the current setup. Um, but at the end of the day, you're, also, you're always there, there is no simple, um, uh, there is no silver bullet here in having more tax powers because you're at the end of the day going to have to trade off one tax against another or taxes more generally against your, your spending. So um, it's a very finely balanced mix, I think. Yeah. Professor Bell. I, I would just make one point, and that is that. Um, Whatever that framework is, if it's uh, transparent and seen to be stable, um, an enduring settlement, uh, then that in itself will maybe provide business with confidence around investing in Scotland. And it is important to, um, to provide business with a um, macro... Um, environment which they believe to be stable uh, and macro and taxation I guess um, and that is vital say for our financial services industry uh, in the short to medium term I, I mean that in a sense goes a little bit against what I, I was saying about or we were all saying about taking some time to sort this out but it may be still worth taking some time to get a stable and uh, uh, a stable fiscal framework that um, not only the uh, people of Scotland but also the business community uh, uh, believe to be um, an enduring settlement. Yeah, Professor Keat. Yeah, yeah, the, the question of austerity, of course, is about the the pace of, of deficit reduction and whether that should be accelerated or slowed down. But even aside from that, there's a broad issue of principle whether we want a larger public sector than might be the preference in, in England. I, I just put that out as a, as, a, as a possibility. The political trends seem to be going in that direction. Uh, and then as far as the economy is concerned, the evidence seems to be it's not so much the level of public spending but exactly what you spend it on. Uh, and we're doing some work in, in our project, which, which uh, David is involved in as well, trying to work out what kinds of expenditure are productivity enhancing uh, and, and, and what are not. So breaking down public expenditure, so addressing these productivity problems uh, and trying to model those and so we can work out what the long-term impact of different forms of spending is and what we're going to get back at, by way of economic return. Professor no, I don't think that makes sense uh, as a research objective. <laughs> I mean, the whole point is to understand what it is that acts as the determinants of productivity. Um, and that's uh, what my colleagues have been talking about. Okay, thank, okay. You. thank you. Richard? Thank you. Just two questions um, relating mainly to speed of implementation, I guess. The first one is, at the beginning of the session, um, Professor Bell um, talked about problems identifying a definition of a Scottish taxpayer. And obviously, one of the arguments about why Smith could move forward expeditiously with proposals on income tax was that that work's been done for Calmon already. I think we've had evidence to the committee that work is progressing expeditiously in terms of identifying a Scottish taxpayer. But obviously, you're saying that there's, there's problems that are arising in that. Could you give us any more details about where those specific areas of, of difficulty are? Um. My understanding, and it's a pretty loose understanding, is that you know, for 95% of, of Scottish taxpayers, there are no problem. But it's the ones who have, who spend time both in uh, Scotland and uh, and in the rest of the UK, uh, where there uh, may be some uh, doubt. And, and my understanding is, and I, I, I could be wrong, is that HMRC are still working on this issue uh, and, uh, and of course that these 5% may matter a lot because the number of additional rate taxpayers in Scotland is a relatively small number uh, but they contribute uh, highly disproportionately to the overall tax bill. 
it might be worth us finding some more, uh, um, getting some more evidence from HMRC on, on that, um, that then convener, because I think uh, Professor Bell underlines that that's an important issue. But yet, yeah, it may be overcome before within the time scale has been set out. My second question is, it, we've heard evidence uh, about an argument for um, slowing up this process to allow for a greater basket of, of taxes to be available to the Scottish um, government. Um, to give it more opportunities to raise funds for public services, in particular, I think Professor Keating mentioned uh, uh, earlier on in the session as well. Um, I think it's, it's not also say, right to say that that will introduce greater complexity uh, as well, potentially, and to, to see how, how, is, how is that complexity managed in other countries within the European Union? Because I looked at the evidence we, we had from Professor MacDonald and we looked at the, the Basque country in particular, and it seems to me that the, the, there is devolution of, of more taxes there, but it's a pretty complex arrangement, and it seems to be quite narrow as to what the powers actually mean in practice. I mean, what do you think could be the lessons for Scotland and the UK from some, from some of those examples? Well, on the Basque uh, Stroke Navarra experience, uh, I mean, that is often taken to be a situation of full fiscal autonomy, but, and it's fair to say that you do have a devolution of nearly all taxes apart from, I guess, VAT. Um, but if you look at it closely, if you look at the agreement closely, really what they're about is marginal tax changes. It's tax changes at the margin. And um, it is a highly constrained system. Um, it, the, again, the, uh, what they call fiscal pressure, which is really just the tax burden, the fiscal pressure in the devolved areas cannot be very different to the rest of, of Spain, actually. So although they have, in principle a lot of devolved powers, they, they really can't use them very much. So, in other words, you can't have a kind of slash and burn change in, in tax rates. You can have changes at the margin, and it seems to be that, say, you want a, a change in corporation tax, you've got to offset that with some other tax, basically, because they, they also have very tight uh, borrowing rules on top of uh, these marginal tax changes. Now, having said that, um, not so long ago, I was at a conference speaking to the guys that designed the system, and they said it has worked. It has given the Basque Parliament the powers they, they have needed to grow the economy uh, relative to the rest of Spain. And perhaps for economists, that's, that's not that surprising, given that a lot of uh, economic decisions occur at the margin. So I think that, in a broad uh, nutshell, is, is what's going on there. Um, whether that could be replicated here... Is, is unclear, um, but just following on your other point about the complexity, I think the reason there are so many constraints there is because of the complexity. If, if you were to allow all that, that freedom, then I think um, basically the borrowing that would be needed by the Basque uh, region would be um, inconsistent with, with the centre's borrowing, basically, and, and there'd be clear issues there. Yeah, yeah, I, I want to looked at the Basque case and, and, and read about it and talked to people uh, about it. And it, it's true, indeed, that the overall burden of taxation has been consistent with the rest of Spain. VAT is theoretically devolved, but under European rules it can't vary so effectively. It's, it's, it's assigned rather than devolved, and half of it is assigned in the rest of Spain uh, as well. Uh, there's a slightly lower rate of cooperation tax, that's more signaling. It's a headline rate. It's just saying we're open for business. I don't know that 1% makes that diff much difference to investment decisions. It annoys other regions of Spain, but that's part of the objective to say we're, we're open for business. And a, and a slightly higher rate of marginal income tax. So the income tax is more progressive, and that's compensated by a slightly lower cooperation tax rate. But everybody that I talk to, as I say, it's in the detail that it really matters. It's the detailed allowances. So they've got a big problem, like Scotland has, of a very poor uh, private research and development performance. They have the same industrial structure we had, the old heavy industries that didn't traditionally invest a lot in research and development. So there's a massive, massive research and development effort, really disproportional to the rest of, of Spain, uh, and lots of tax credits uh, for research and development. Uh, and then there's the linkage of taxation policy to other fields, so linking to labor market policy, linking to industrial reconversion. So whenever I talk to people uh, about this, they, they, it's, it's not the headline rates, not the overall burden, it's the detail of how we use this taxation as part of a broad social and economic strategy. 
uh, and uh, it, it, it does seem to have been fairly, fairly successful. It is extremely complex because there are four separate authorities, because it's the three Basque provinces plus Navarre. That's for historic reasons that are untouchable. Nobody says it makes any, an, 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 any sense. I've also talked to business people. I've talked to the trade unions. The business community like the idea. They like the idea that the tax authority is close. They're not worried about it. They say we can cope with complexity. So, uh, and, and, and they like the idea that they're in direct dialogue with government about taxation rather than having to go to Madrid uh, to do things. Uh, and the other interesting case is, is, is Canada, where there has been, there's extensive devolution of taxation. Oh, it's not devolution, it's a federal system, so they have by right extensive income taxes, sales taxes, and corporation taxes. The sales tax coexists with a federal value-added tax called the goods and services tax. And the provinces deal with this in very different ways. So in Quebec, they've decided to link their sales tax to the federal value-added tax, and in the other provinces, they haven't. And by, on, by contrast, in Quebec, they've decided to delink their income tax from the federal income tax and have their own tax regimes, whereas the other provinces piggyback on the federal tax regime. So you just pay a proportion of the federal taxes to the uh, provincial authorities. So there is scope when you look at the details of policy divergence that are possible there for quite a bit of differentiation. And Quebec is very, very different from Alberta in, in its tax structure. Uh, and some recent evidence that we've got suggests that Quebec, because of its tax and welfare mix, has been able to resist the tendency to greater social and economic inequality that's happened in the rest of Canada. So those might look like marginal differences, but they can make a considerable difference to policy outcomes. Thank you, Camille. Thank you uh, for that. Uh, Malcolm, to followed by Joan. Well, I, I was going to ask about the Basque Country as well, which has been very uh, comprehensively dealt with, but I suppose it was part of Professor MacDonald's uh, paper and part of his more general discussion on full fiscal autonomy. So um, obviously there's a lot of discussion about that. So I just wondered if we could have a little bit more light shed on that. I mean, Professor MacDonald, you said in the past you talked about, I don't know if you were advocating or just describing some form of fiscal autonomy. And you've got various references in your paper uh, that if a more radical form of fiscal autonomy were adopted, uh, such as full fiscal autonomy, there would still need to be a block grant and the adjustment. And then towards the end of your paper, you say there would also need to be um, central bank and exchange rate uh, policy. Presumably that means independence. So I'm just wondering what, <laughs> uh, what form of full, uh, of full fiscal autonomy you think may be viable and, and what kind you think would, 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 would really be ruled out. Um, I think I'm saying basically full fiscal autonomy where you've got the wholesale devolution of, of all tax revenue and expenditure with some uh, premium paid for defence uh, and foreign affairs, I, I don't think that is possible short of full independence, no. Um, and, and that was the point I was making there. Fiscal autonomy, uh, where you have a devolution mix perhaps along the lines of, of the Basque country is, is feasible because, for example, it works in other countries as, as we've just heard. Um, but obviously the complexity of these systems takes, takes a considerable amount of time to, to be worked out. And it has to be borne in mind, of course, as well, I think, and, and this is often forgotten in the mix, that Scotland is a very different, uh, well, the United Kingdom is a very different setup to most other countries, and, and Scotland, as part of that, is a very small open economy, as, as economists would call it, and um, that has important implications when you start to think about the very significant price and inflation uh, differentials that exist within monetary unions, for example, the, the Canadian case that uh, Professor Keating has talked about, there are fairly dramatic uh, inflation differentials within Canada. There are also fairly dramatic uh, inflation differentials, uh, as we know, within the euro area. Now, if you're moving away from a system of, of co-insurance, if you're moving away from a, a fiscal union as we, we've had in the UK, then basically the big issue is how do you address these competitiveness changes? And for me, this is one of, as a macroeconomist, it's one of the big things we've got to think about, about uh, any further devolutions in the uh, UK context, particularly if we are going for, uh, say, closer to a fiscal autonomy uh, solution, because uh, these competitiveness changes can be large and persistent, 
and they can lead to imbalances, which if you do not have a independent central bank or independent monetary policy, will be persistent and can lead to changes in the tax base, a whole host of macroeconomic implications. So um, there's, there's lots there to, to, to be addressed and thought about, I think, yeah. Well, I, I was interested in, in your paragraph about that, and obviously you talked about productivity differences as well, usually explained in the context of the Balassa samuelson hypothesis. I'm afraid I don't yes. know what that is, but <laughs> I, I suppose a more general question is, I mean, you know, we've looked to full fiscal autonomy, but that's not, um, I, I would imagine, going to happen any time soon, and you're probably arguing it can't happen at all except within a constrained model. But in terms of what we're more likely to get around Smith or Smith Plus, are these inflation and productivity issues important there as well, and how, how should we factor them in if you think they are important? Yes, they are, they are there, and they are important, um, and they can accumulate into big differences, as we, as we see in some other experiences. Um, and it's, an, it's especially tricky in the context of a um, monetary union where you have inflation targeting, which is what we have at the moment, um, because it's quite simple to demonstrate in, in a very simple economic model that your competitiveness, that's basically your relative inflation, becomes quite volatile. Uh, and that volatility is, is bad news for business, basically, because they, they like a, a relatively stable cost base. Uh, they don't like volatility. They don't like that kind of uncertainty. So given my point about Scotland being a small open economy with a lot of capital and labour mobility, it would be very easy for the, the, um, the movement of capital and labour to, say, undo uh, fiscal changes that may be made by, by the Scottish Parliament. So, um, yeah, so huge, huge complexity here. And I think the, it is very important that the, the, the price or inflation issue is, is thought about and, and addressed, as I say, especially in the context of, of an inflation targeting central bank. But in terms of productivity, presumably a devolved government, particularly one with more powers, could, could take some significant action in relation to that. Yes, indeed. I mean, there are, uh, there are um, measures that could be taken now to address productivity. Um, the, the issue that, that arises, though, this Balassa Samuelson, it's one of the better known explanations for price differences within monetary unions. It basically says that if you have divergence of productivity, and of course that, in a sense, I suppose, is what the devolution of powers is about. You, you want divergence, you want to be different to your, your partners, if you're successful in creating this divergence, that will have further implications for these price differences I'm, I'm talking about, and uh, will have further implications for the competitiveness of your, your trading sector. But if, if, if we did succeed, if you could be a bit more concrete, if we did succeed in raising the rate of productivity in Scotland, are you, you're saying that would have negative as well as positive consequences? Yes, potentially. It can have effects on, on, um, on prices and competitiveness, depending, depending on how the, the productivity works through. I mean, economists have various uh, channels through which competitiveness works. If it, if it goes through the service sector or the, the tradable goods sector, it can have different implications. But... Um, one of the big uh, empirical stylized facts is that if you do have improved uh, productivity in your tradable sector, say, that will often be transferred through to your non-traded or service sector, which can increase the prices of all goods in your economy relative to your, your trading partners. So although on the face of it productivity is a good thing, it can have these important implications for your competitiveness, which need to be thought through in a macroeconomic context. Seven seems to take a bit longer to deal with Smith to factor all that in. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Malcolm. Uh, John, to be followed by Gavin. Hey, thanks, convener. Um, I mean, we've got this phrase, an enduring settlement, uh, which I think is the UK government's phrase, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I mean, I'm just wondering, is it actually so important to have an enduring settlement so that something is fixed for the next 25 or 50 years? I mean, presumably the alternative is a more fluid settlement. And, and we look at things and we keep revising things. So if we've got 50% of that, that might do us for a few years. Then we might look at 75% or 40% and, and have it on a kind of more movable feast. It, it, would that be a possibility or is that not a good thing? Looking, I, look, you're looking at me probably, um, uh, since I was the one that opened it up on the enduring settlement. I think the point is uh, that uh, the, what, is, what one is looking for is uh, 
the right amount of stability in the uh, for so that business can plan properly, consumers can make sensible decisions about uh, long-term investments in housing or in education or whatever. Um, so, uh, it, I, it certainly, I wouldn't. I think it would be wrong to think that what it means by an enduring settlement is um, things chiselled in stone, right? <laughs> <laughs> As we know, these <laughs> tend not to uh, be terribly enduring. Uh, what, one, what one's looking for is, is a system that can adapt to change because, of course, there can be substantial external forces at work which mean that you do need to rethink the way you organise things. So um, certainly um, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't want to think that, that what we're setting in place here is a kind of constitution for all time. I think that would be a dreadful mistake. I think we, sh we should have a constitution which uh, is solid, uh, people feel they, un they know their rights and so on, but that as things change, we can, we can rethink the constitution. We are saying that maybe you know, we should set a, a, a time limit, like 10 years, and so we would say, well, we'll look again at Barnet or whatever the formula is, and the powers every 10 years or every 15 or... Is that, is that even too fixed? Well, I, I, I think, again, it depends on the strength of the winds that are buffeting you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I mean, for example, if you decided to plot a course in a boat for 10 years across some endless ocean and, you know, halfway across, suddenly the winds change, it doesn't make sense to keep on, may not make sense to keep on your course. That's that, what, what, you, what you do need... Uh, is a sensible sort of flexibility in, the, in your constitutional structure that allows you to say, oh, things have changed sufficiently, that we do need to think about the way we've organised things. That's, that's the, the point I think I'd want to make. OK, I mean, Professor Bell, you're nodding at that, although you were arguing earlier on for, um, you know, business likes to know where we're going kind of thing. How do we tie the two of them together? Well, I, I, I think that um, it's important, as I said earlier, that... Um, the major stakeholders in the economy are in a position that they can make long-term plans because lo the, the fulfillment of long-term plans, investment in infrastructure and factories or whatever, are the sorts of things that do enhance productivity and, and lead to higher uh, living standards. You don't want a situation where business is uncertain because the tax regime may change at a moment's notice uh, about the uh, you, you know the effect that might have on willingness to invest so i guess i'm uh, i'm uh, i'm not trying to roll back i i don't think as professor beeth has said that 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 uh, something set in stone is the answer. It's something that has the confidence of the key stakeholders in the economy, whether that be uh, consumers, producers, um, other levels of government, that if there are changes, nevertheless, um, um, they don't disrupt the plans to enhance Scotland's uh, productivity and, uh, you know, the general improvement in its economic conditions. You want to go? Come on. Yes, I, I have to recognise the reality that a lot of this is, is driven by politics. That, that's, that's part of the democratic process, that change is very often incremental. There's got to be a certain flexibility. Uh, but we do need a degree, a degree of stability and degree of consistency. And the trend internationally has been introducing incremental change, bits and pieces here and there, and then occasionally taking a pause and asking, what, what, what have we produced here? They're going through this at the moment in, in Spain, where they've had the revision of all their separate statutes of autonomy, the re revised taxes, bits and pieces here and there, and produced something that's pretty incoherent and pretty dysfunctional. So they're having to sit down and think through how all this uh, adds up. And at some point, with the changes going on in Wales and Northern Ireland and eventually in England as well, at some point we're going to have to sit down and think uh, how it all fits together. Uh, we also are in a situation where we don't have a political consensus on the end point, and we're not going to have it because there are people who want independence and people who don't. That's just a fact. And, and both of these are, are legitimate points of view. 
We've got to live with that, but we don't even have agreement here, it seems, on what the questions are. Not the answers, but what the questions are, what the fundamental issues are. So uh, it would be useful to pause and think about what the fundamental issues are that we disagree about and, and what the basis of the debate is here before rushing into sorting out very detailed aspects of, of the settlement. And I think that's where Smith went wrong. Go straight to the details, see what we concede, rather than thinking what are the main issues at stake here and do we or do we not disagree about what the principles uh, should be. And I think the political conjuncture at the moment is such that we do have a couple of years to, to think this through. Uh, we, 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 it was impossible to do this maybe in the last legislature, but now, or in the run-up to the referendum, but now we do have that opportunity. Okay, thank you. Did you want to say anything, Professor MacDonald? You? No, I have nothing You're to okay say. You're okay on that one. Yeah. I mean, another area was a relations a, we've talked about and the suggestion that there should be more of a structure and perhaps something slightly more independent, an arbiter or something like that. I just wonder, I mean, is there any advantage for the UK government in having different intergovernment relations? Because at the moment they can basically impose anything they want. So why would they want to have some kind of more fair and open and transparent system? Is there any advantage for them in that? A question for a political scientist. I'm not scientist. aiming at anyone in particular. I've always been very suspicious of the proliferation of intermental intergovernmental committees and, and joint ministerial committees and committees for this, that and the other thing. Uh, which don't have very much to do and which people don't attend. So I would be very parsimonious in thinking about what intergovernmental mechanisms we do need to have. Uh, and I've suggested three. One is about Europe, which we already have. Another is about welfare. And the third is about finance. It really, it really does matter here. Uh, and the, we know that the UK Treasury has a very centralist mentality. And this is, this is just an obstacle to thinking about devolution generally, but it would be in the interest of the Treasury, presumably, to have some kind of stability, uh, to know what the rules of, of, of the game are. Uh, and it would be, it is important there should be some kind of forum where these things can be discussed and debated. They are political, of course, and it's about politics, but where they can be debated. Uh, and it's also important that somewhere within this intergovernmental uh, machinery, there should be independent sources of, of, of information, so at least we have a common database to have the arguments about the territorial distribution of finance. Would the decision still be with the Treasury, do you think, or should we be removing that? Well, this, that's, that's, that's absolutely critical because there's been a lot of talk about federalism in, in, in recent months. Federalism is the answer. In a federal system, the central government would not be allowed unilaterally to make those decisions. That's what makes federalism different from devolution. The difficulty getting there is that it's difficult to do it just for three parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, but but, but uh, certainly in, in, in principle, in a proper federal system, the centre should not be allowed unilaterally to take those decisions. There should be some kind of statutory formula, which can be revised, but some formula and some certainty uh, in the outcome so that both sides will, will, will know what the rules are and both sides will know what their basic entitlements are. If it's simply unilaterally being done by the Treasury, that's not, that's not federalism in any meaningful sense. Okay, thank you. Um, another area I wanted to touch on was going back to the Fiscal Commission. I mean, it concerns me sometimes that we're a relatively small country with five million people, and we're trying to copy the things that are going on either in the United States with 300 million or even the UK with 50 million. Um, I mean, I'm very keen that one of the advantages we have of being smaller is we can do things in a more simple way. So, for example, the, the suggestion, which I think I'm picking up from your papers, that you know the Fiscal Commission should maybe do its own forecasts, but then we've also got the government doing its forecasts, and, and that worries me about duplication. I think Professor MacDonald used the word overseeing the forecasts, which I thought was interesting, as to that might mean they don't do it themselves, but they just kind of audit or look over it. And we talked about independence earlier, and I mean, something like... A audit Scotland, I think, are seen as very independent and quite trustworthy, but they don't actually do things themselves, they just check on others. So it's that area of, is it important the Fiscal Commission does the forecasts, or as long as they're checking, is that okay? Um, well, suppose they, let's suppose they just check, right? Um, what is it, what would happen? They, uh, they'd, they'd essentially be saying things like, 
Well, we, uh, if it's true, if you make this assumption and that assumption and this parameter is that's what it is and that parameter is what it is, indeed this is the number you get out and they've done the calculations right. Um, I, that, that I think is, that, that sort of, um, that, that in a sense is just reinforcing uh, or, or, or a, a, sort of, a sort of checking that the arithmetic is right. I think what we're, we're thinking about is a rather, a rather more robust uh, uh, mechanism that says, um, well, we don't think that assumption is right. Uh, we, we, you know, our evidence suggests that this parameter in some relationship uh, is a different number. That's, that's the kind of independence that one's looking for. Um, you know, that, that, is, that is the kind of, uh, uh, I think, proper refereeing. Professor McDonald? Yes, I agree with uh, what, what John is saying there. I mean, I, I think you've made a good point that, you know, it, we want to be able to do this as efficiently and economically as, as, as possible. And uh, there's, there's no point in reinventing the wheel, as it were. But um, I think in, in terms of forecasting, um, there are obviously different ways of uh, setting a model up and, and therefore the point that uh, Professor Beath is making about the assumptions used uh, could well affect the outcomes from the model. And it may not be, you know, even if, if we have an independent fiscal commission, it may be difficult for them to scrutinise someone else's model to really get to grips with what's, what's going on there. More than the actual, you know, relationship between the organisations. Yeah, it probably is. It's, it's to do with resources, certainly. Um, um, it may be that the Scottish government has has a different agenda to what the um, what the, uh, the fiscal commission have, and I, I would think it would be helpful. I mean, you, you could always, I suppose, buy in the, uh, the the forecast as well if that were more more effective. Maybe from from the OBR um, because they, the Scotland model. I mean, they seem to be able to dig quite deep and really challenge government and challenge anyone for that matter, uh, quite hard hitting often. So that, I mean, that seems to me like a good model. Yes, yeah, yeah. I would agree. But um, w I, I just wonder if they would have the skill sets to be able to understand what the, say the econometric model that the Scottish government is, is using. I suppose, yeah, they could hire a, a specialist team to, mm -hmm. to, to do that perhaps. Um, but, um, you know, I think I think you have raised a valid point in terms of not not repeating what perhaps other units are doing, and and it may well be more efficient to to buy our forecasts if we want independent forecasts from the OBR, and um, for the fiscal commission to use these. Okay. Anyone else want to comment on that, Professor Bell? Well, I, I mean, I think we've discussed this before. Audit, Audit Scotland's role is really retrospective, and what we're talking about is a prospective role here. Uh, yeah, the model. I mean, yes. there, I, I think the, the committee has argued in the past that, that, that there's an argument for linking up these these kinds of activities, and I, I, I don't see a problem with that. But I mean, picking up the the others' um, remarks about forecasting, I have been involved with forecasting models uh, myself in the past, and really, you know inspecting what someone has done differs massively from running a model 100, 200 times to just fine tune it to make sure that everything that uh, is in there agrees with um, um, the best evidence that, uh, that uh, can be assembled. So there, I think there's always a, um, an argument for having a forecasting capability where that is cited may not matter too much. And uh, another thing that I do think is important to caution against is, is what is known as the herd instinct. So forecasters tend by magic, even with quite different models, tend to uh, come up with quite similar forecasts. Uh, and uh, for example, in 2008, that really was uh, rather problematic um, so that, uh, this whole area has to be thought through uh, uh, pretty carefully. I mean, is it there any way to stop the herd instinct then? Um, well, you, you could ask... Uh, um, you could ask people to say, well, really, what is the methodology that you're, you're using for 
uh, your forecast. One of the big issues in the past few years has been what's called mean reversion. So we've discussed productivity a lot. Uh, a lot of the models uh, in, of the UK tend to uh, deal with some cyclical ups and downs, but revert to a situation where productivity is yes, growing at around 2% yes. per year. And actually, the last six years, that's hopeless. Mm. So, you know, you want to have a situation where people, are, where whoever is involved with this activity isn't necessarily tied into uh, a, a methodology that has not uh, not served as well in the past, put it that way. Uh, just one final thing. I mean, one of the uh, things that one might want to look at, for example, is how um, this activity is carried out in Ireland. Scotland's actually larger uh, than Ireland. I think it's the ESRI, the Economic and Social Research Institute in Dublin, uh, that does a lot of this work. It might, work, might be worth uh, uh, even speaking to the director of that institute, Alan Barrett, uh, about uh, their role and how they interact with the Irish government. Okay, that's great. Thanks so much. Gavin? Uh, um, first question then is on borrowing powers. I just wonder if, if any of the panellists want to share with us the extent of borrowing powers that they think will be required um, during the implementation of Smith as opposed to the borrowing powers we get under Calman. I just wonder um, if you have any firm views on the, the extent or uh, levels that uh, would be optimal. Well, following on from the last question, you just mentioned one uh, quick point there, that um, the more accurate the forecasts are, the better, because uh, you've got to allow for a buffer in terms of borrowing for bad forecasts. And so if the forecasting unit is, is poor repeatedly, you're going to have a big buffer there uh, for borrowing purposes just, just for your bad forecasts. So I think that's a point worth bearing in mind. In, t in terms of, um, of, of Smith, uh, it, it is what's behind your question whether there are enough borrowing powers uh, under, under Smith going forward relative to Kalman? Yeah, well, but some, well, some some people, you know, suggest that the borrowing powers via Calman aren't aren't sufficient for Calman. So obviously, with Smith is uh, far greater than Calman, so automatically uh, the borrowing powers would have to be greater. But it's trying to work out what, you know, should we have a situation where there are there are there are no limits whatsoever? Should there be uh, caps or limits both for uh, revenue and capital, or is there is there some kind of is it an optimal model in your in your view of, of what would be appropriate for borrowing powers? I'm not sure there's an optimal model, but uh, I, I certainly don't think you could have uh, unfettered borrowing in, in, in the open market, which some people have suggested. Uh, the Canadians do that, and it has led to a lot of indiscipline in terms of, in terms of borrowing, and it has affected the, the premium uh, some of the, 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 the uh, federal states actually pay. Uh, on, on their borrowing. So I, I wouldn't recommend um, market borrowing. I think there will need to be quite important constraints. The, the experience of other countries, if you, if you look at it, is uh, pretty, pretty strong constraints in borrowing. The, going back to the Basque experience, for example, they have uh, fairly uh, dramatic strictures on, on uh, borrowing, uh, fairly uh, dramatic limits. So uh, the short answer is yes, you would need more borrowing, obviously, than than Kalman, but there, there is no ma magic formula for um, the, the amount of, of borrowing. Yeah. Okay, I wonder if any other panellists have, have different views or different thoughts on borrowing. I, I, think I, I did a calculation about um, the, the, um, if the uh, Scottish income tax revenues were subject to the same unexpected decline has happened to UK tax revenues in 2009, then um, I think that forecast error would have been around £500 million pounds under, under Smith. So, you know, there, 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 there's a case for uh, certainly more to cover, but that was, that was probably the best example of a complete forecasting um, snafu uh, in uh, in 
certainly this century, <laughs> probably the last century as well. Um, so th there is an argument for that. Um, borrowing by the Scottish Government will count against the UK's um, borrowing uh, uh, total. So it is likely, as Professor MacDonald uh, uh, says, that that is likely to be constrained because uh, the uh, uh, UK government won't want uh, uh, extra excessive borrowing by the Scottish uh, uh, government to lead to, uh, say, an increase in in, uh, in the rates on, on UK debt. It would be an interesting question about whether that is a detriment um, because the cost of making good on the detriment uh, of uh, a small, a tiny increase in interest rates, given that uh, uh, debt interest is around £70 billion a year at, at the moment, would, could be quite considerable. Just, just briefly on the, on the, the £500 million pound figure you, you put out, I mean, that was obviously 2008, which was a... Uh, an extreme situation, but was that just for income tax? So if, if you're looking at other yes. taxes, it would have been, you know, potentially yes. much, much larger than that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, any, any other comments on borrowing from panelists? I was going to just say that across Europe, the trend is for more controls on sub-state yeah. borrowing everywhere because they count for national targets within Europe and in international markets as well. Okay. Um, if we come back to this is for Professor Keating. Intergovernmental relations. Um, you, you're sceptical about having too many uh, set up that are, that are ineffective. There have been uh, criticisms by witnesses about the existing machinery. Um, every witness will, will tell us we need to, to have more effective, we probably need to have a slightly more formal system. But in, in terms of actual specifics, are, are there any, are there any uh, concrete things you would tell us that you think you must have that otherwise uh, you're doomed to fail? Or is it, is it a case of... Um, working through as we go along, or are there certain things there you think we must have in position if we're to have any chance of uh, succeeding? Well, the things we've been talking about in this meeting to do with finance are absolutely critical and are necessary for Smith or going beyond Smith. Uh, there, was, there was an absence in, in advance of this kind of thing, but it didn't matter so much. But if you're devolving the whole of income tax, then it does become absolutely critical. And I put an emphasis on the common database, or, or, or at least shared databases, so that we, we're not dependent entirely on treasury databases, a forum for political negotiation, so it's not just unilaterally handed down, and, and greater clarity, greater transparency uh, in, in, in all of this, so that the public and, and this parliament and the Westminster parliament can get to grips with this and see what's going on and, and where the money is actually going. Okay. And just last issue, I mean, we've talked about the Fiscal Commission uh, in detail, but just one comment made in, in, Professor, in the Professor Beat's paper. Um, <laughs> you talked about providing forecasts, which I think has been well covered. You also mentioned in your paper, though, the idea that they should provide some kind of strategic commentary, especially over longer-term trends and issues. So I just wonder if you can expand on, on that a little bit. Well, um, what I what I was what what I think uh, we were thinking on the on the working group was that um, uh, the role of this uh, of this um, expanded fiscal commission uh, would be not just to um, uh, not just to uh, look at uh, critique and uh, comment on. Uh, things that the government was proposing to do and came out of its, the, you know, the, its departmental forecast, but actually uh, was able to say, okay, you're going down that line, that route. Um, are you sure that is the right route to go down? It's that, it's that kind of asking questions and, and sometimes forcing uh, the government to say, well, the reason we're going down this, this route is for... A, B, C, D. And then, then at least we've got some, I, I think, a more transparent uh, system. We can have debate, we can have discussion that I think is more balanced and, and equal and probably valuable. Well, thank you. Could, could, could I just add to that? I mean, there's uh, not only the issue of um, testing the government and, it, and the assumptions that it's, that it's, uh, that it's making, but also there's um, 
the equivalent of what the uh, Office of Budget Responsibility does with its fiscal sustainability reports. Mm -hmm. Remember that you know the the annual uh, uh, fiscal deficit or surplus doesn't necessarily give you uh, a clear perspective of all of the liabilities and and the assets the assets that uh, that. Um, uh, government may face over the next 20, 10, 20 years. So uh, if you're thinking of increasing your borrowing now a lot, or uh, um, what position will you be in when there's a big bulge in the baby boomers retiring, that sort of thing. These are the sort of issues that this committee has, has dealt with quite a lot in the past and would seem to me to be another as well as the budget process, to be a, a, a very clear um, point of contact between the activities of this committee and, uh, and that of the fiscal body, whatever, whatever it uh, may be. Okay, so I mean, just, to, just to follow up on that then, you're, you're based, instead of just looking at, say, the forecast period, which would be, what, three years or four years, yeah. you're saying they, they ought to be taking a, looking a kind of over several decades about what, what might happen if, if things don't change. Yeah, okay. if, I mean, if you look at the whole of government accounts rather than the, the, the profit and loss, effect, the annual profit and loss, you've got all these things that are piling up, public sector pensions, um, the state pension is not actually included in, in the whole of government accounts, but um, uh, from that you get a much broader perspective of the, the kinds of things that are likely to impact on finances other than the cyclical, you know, the economy's up, the economy's down, two to three year effects. But these longer run effects should act as either encouraging or cautionary in terms of uh, what you do with taxes in Scotland now. Because what will it, what will it be like five, year, five years down the road? Thank you. Thank you. thank you, Jean. Yes, thank you. Um, I want to just go back uh, to something that you said, Professor Bell, about business confidence and the, and the kind of stakeholders and all of this. But it occurs to me that um, over the years we've had lots of predictions of what business, what makes business uh, nervous and so on. And yet in Scotland, I think uh, uh, I'm right in saying that although there have been predictions, in fact, business in Scotland has been extraordinarily stable. Um, first of all, in terms of the, I mean, it's a nation of small businesses, I grant that. But what, I mean, what would be the, you know, during the, the referendum debate, of course, there was lots of, of, of kind of shock headlines about businesses leaving and so on. But once we dug down into that, in fact, the reality, I believe, was quite different. Uh, this is an extraordinarily difficult thing to get uh, uh, a grasp of. Um, Scottish uh, business in Scotland at the moment is doing well in the sense that, for example, employment in Scotland has never been higher. There's 2.3 million people working in Scotland, uh, which is, uh, at least in recorded uh, uh, history, uh, uh, an all-time high. Um, Scotland also has tended to do very well in foreign, foreign direct investment, second to London within, uh, within the UK. And uh, from the data we've got, again, data is, the most recent is 2013, uh, where it looks like the Scotland's uh, uh, performance on foreign direct investment is still relatively good. You do have to think about um, uh, not just the businesses that are currently here, but the business also think about the businesses that potentially could be here if they thought the environment was a suitable environment, if the tax structure was stable and, and, and all the things that, uh, that uh, we've talked about. I don't see that in the, um, you know, in the last few months there has been anything that has massively changed around, uh, uh, around uh, the Scottish uh, business uh, environment, um, well, we do have quite a lot of 
biggish business. Is it, it's, uh, to be fair, it's not just a, a nation of, uh, of, uh, of, of small businesses. One of the things that's a little bit worrying is that relatively few of them are headquartered in Scotland. So, um, uh, you know, decisions are being made uh, uh, dispassionately comparing Scotland to other parts of the world in terms of uh, how um, competitive they are. So, uh, you know, the whole macro environment uh, does come into this. But um, I don't think that anything has very massively there's no evidence that anything has very massively changed in the last few months. But as I say, we don't really know much about what it might have been uh, because we don't know about, uh, about the foreign direct investment that didn't happen. Okay, and maybe just uh, as a supplement to that, I mean, some of the issues that have scared the horses maybe were not predicted in any case. Would you agree, whether in terms of interest rates or other, other uh, circumstances that either politicians or economists didn't actually foresee happening? Uh, there's been a lot of debate about how the um, economy, the UK economy and the Scottish economy, because the Scottish economy has pretty much tracked the economy of the UK as a whole over the last five years. And there have been uh, various predictions and various surprises uh, I think the surprise was mainly the um, recovery uh, in terms of uh, growth in output and very surprisingly much stronger growth in the labour market and, uh, and in its performance. And uh, there has been this complete flatlining of productivity, which um, uh, labour economists and uh, 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 industrial economists are struggling to explain and haven't satisfactorily explained. But um, these kinds of the unexpected recovery has really had a, a very big effect on on employment, for example, in Scotland and unemployment more than I would suggest than than the political uh, uh, events that have occurred in the last uh, year or so. Um. I'm just going back uh, to uh, another, an earlier uh, point. One of the anxieties, I think, was the, the, the lack of, of data that we have in order to make, I think Vaux referred to that, but I just wonder what the, in terms of timescales, I mean, is that a priority now for, for SNAP and ONS figures to be uh, calibrated to show outcomes and so on bef before final decisions on Smith or um, are, we, are we going to live by taking the decision and living with the evidence after the event? Well, I mean, the, the data, um, these things are not, cannot be put in place very quickly. And, and if you're looking for data on things you haven't collected data on before, you're also looking not only for where we are now, but what the trend has been over the last 5, 10, 20 years. Um, I think the best course of action would be once some uh, uh, idea uh, of, the, of, the, of the nature of the powers um, uh, is, uh, is, is out there, I suppose, you could treat Smith as a starting point, but to think very carefully about what um, extra data requirements there, there would be for uh, a, a, a body like uh, Fiscal Affairs Scotland and to put some resource uh, uh, into uh, relevant data collection, but to uh, do that jointly with ONS and, and ONS might ask for resources because they are extremely short of resources uh, uh, to carry out this kind of work. But I, I guess what I'm saying is that there should be a kind of, given the nature of the settlement, there should be an, a, a, a committee or whatever looking at the information requirements that are necessary to take that kind of activity forward. <laughs> 
Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Jean. Uh, that has concluded the questions for our committee. I've just got a couple more to uh, round us off. Um, first one is uh, Professor Keating. You said, uh, um, you know, there appear to be more controls on borrowing. In fact, there are more controls uh, 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 in substate. Um, and general borrowing as we go forward. But Smith has recommended that borrowing powers for Scotland should be subject to fiscal rules agreed by the two governments. Um, the UK already has such fiscal rules. Uh, do you think it's feasible um, for Scotland to have different rules? Uh, well, I'd I, I leave the economic feasibility to my, to my colleagues, but uh, the critical thing in, in other countries is that the overall uh, level of debt within the state should be in the euro countries within the euro limits, but in other countries subject to different limits as well because there are also limits in the Maastricht Treaty uh, as well. Uh, and the question is how that is distributed between the central government and the territorial governments, the local and the devolved. Uh, governments. That's a matter of political negotiation. In Spain, it's done through the Fiscal Council, which represents the autonomous communities and the central government. It's not unilateral. They have to uh, agree on this. At the end of the day, the central government has a limit that comes from Brussels, and it's got to distribute that. And then the distribution amongst the autonomous communities is done within that council. Now, this is because they have 17 autonomous communities, so they have devolution <coughs> everywhere. They don't have the asymmetric system. But it does show that it is possible to do this in a negotiated way. It doesn't have to be a unilateral top-down. Uh, and then in distributing the burden amongst the different autonomous communities, they do take into account the conditions in those different regions uh, and, and, and what the, the, the economic conditions, the accumulated debt, the liabilities, and so on. So there is a way of trying to work out the distribution. And therefore, it's, it's not the, the target that is given to one region is not necessarily the same as it is in, in other regions. And presumably, something like that could be worked out in the UK as well, because the circumstances of different parts of the UK are quite, are quite different. But the important thing is it's, it's, it's something that has to be negotiated and agreed for, for the state as a whole. And negotiated and not imposed, uh, Professor Beath? No, I think that's no. Some Any other comments? <laughs> well, Scotland doesn't have a debt at the, you know, at the moment. That's, that, that's the, the, the current um, position. Smith didn't propose you know, assigning debt to uh, parceling it out in the way that Professor Keating has, uh, has described. Um, so Scotland doesn't have a set of fiscal rules other than to meet, uh, uh, to not overspend its budget, um, given a small amount of flexibility. We've discussed, you know, we had end year flexibility and we've had various things uh, are replacing that. And Scotland's always managed to stick to that rule. That's, its, that's been its fiscal rule. Uh, exploring uh, uh, a different one might take us even longer than we would uh, be thinking about allowing to sort out the uh, tax system. But uh, um, I suspect that uh, the UK government, this is not a line that it would really want to go down. Ms McDonald, have you got any views on that? Nothing really to add, no. Okay, that's fine. And just one uh, final question, which is, um, I mean, what would be the implications uh, for the Scottish budget of not having the second no detriment principle, i.e. Um, the principle as a result of UK or Scottish government uh, policy decisions uh, falling for their devolution? the question yeah basically what would be the implications for the scottish budget of not having the second no detriment principle uh, that being that uh, as a result of uk and scottish government policy decisions following further devolution you know so for example um you know the, the scottish government does something completely different from the uk as opposed to um you know just uh, and the, the first no detriment principle has just been the devolution of powers per se what i'm saying is um uh, if you they, know, the if they decisions did something made. completely novel, yes, indeed, uh, and uh, you didn't have to worry about the impact that it had on uh, elsewhere in the in the UK. Um, well, uh, where would that where would that stop? Uh, that's, that's like giving like giving you kind of unlimited powers, isn't it? I, I mean, it would seem to me that if 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 Scotland didn't do much relative to the rest of the UK, then no detriment principle wouldn't kick in. 
So it's the extent of divergence, uh, you know, how far it, it, it say, it decre do, does what the, back, the Basques do, um, you know, reduce uh, taxes on business rates, but increase the, the top rates of income tax, for example. Um, then you've got a calculation to work out because you've got relative change. And it, it, it's really the extent of relative change that in, in terms of tax rates and tax policies, tax rates in the first instance, tax policies. Example, for example, was that uh, in terms of this would be that uh, um, the APD, which was touched on earlier on by the, by the panel, and Newcastle, of course, was cited, as it always seems to be. But George Osborne in January, more or less, said, you know, that there wouldn't be, as far as he was concerned, there wouldn't be a kind of compensatory uh, issue involving that. You know, so, for example, even if there was a, a, a detriment as such, or, you know, to Newcastle, allegedly, although I don't see why, given that Scottish passengers would just go to Scottish airports and say, I'm going to travel south, so I would have thought that would have been a natural... Um, uh, thing in any case, uh, if it has, wasn't for the current situation, then the, his view was that he wouldn't consider that to be non-detrimental. So that's what I'm saying is, um, w would in actual fact this allow much greater flexibility without, you know, Scottish government, for example, having to look over its shoulder all the time at, well, if we do this, we might have to compensate yeah. because of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, th I think George Osborne was saying he was, he was relaxed about tax competition because that's consistent with his ideological position uh, anyway, and other parties might be more, more concerned about it. Labour Chancellor might be more concerned about that. Uh, but but it's, it's, it's the definition of no detriment that, that is critical. Uh, and once you get into tax competition, well, almost anything then could potentially qualify. So I can see a need for something very specific around the area of welfare benefits and the linkage of welfare benefits whether it's compensation or, or simply an intergovernmental mechanism trigger to try and resolve the anomaly. But the broad no detriment principle seems to me far too large and, and it would get us into all kinds of problems. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, with that, we'll wind up the session. I want to, to thank uh, the witnesses for contributions, just to see if there's any further points you'd like to make on any issue which uh, has been covered or indeed has been omitted from questions. Anybody got anything else you want to add? No? Well, it's been quite a long session, so thank you very much for, for answering your questions so uh, comprehensively. Thank you very much. That being the final item on our agenda, that's the end of today's committee meeting. Thank you all.